Hello. Right, today, we're going to see if the clicker works. Yes, it does. Today, we're going to talk about how accessibility is usability. Usability is accessibility. And if you have one, you do not have the other. So if your site isn't accessible, it is simply not usable, in my not-so-humble opinion. Only then, oh, hello, stop. I'm giving spoilers. Only then are we going to end up with an inclusive web that, quite frankly, we all deserve. Now, just a little note on the kind of language that I'm going to use today, and I'm not even going to use that because it ain't working. Um, there is some discussion about whether we should use the term disabled people or people with disabilities. Now, Scope, which is a, an organization, a charity who works with disabled people, tell us that we should use that term. The reason for that is that often the impairments don't disable people. Our design choices disable people. So for a concrete example then, if you were a wheelchair user and you had money and there was a shop and they had a thing that you wanted, you could go and you could buy it, right? But if there's no ramp, you can't get into the shop. It's not you, it's not you, it's not any of your impairments that's stopping you. It's a lack of design that is stopping you. So I'm going to be using disabled people throughout this presentation. Having a look at what disabilities themselves are then. If you've seen this, it's the Microsoft Inclusivity Kit. It's very good, it's really quite comprehensive. And over this session today, I'm going to show you how just with your content alone, you will be able to open up everything that you and your organization are saying to that whole spectrum of people. Okay, so when we think of disabilities, we often think about the permanent ones, right? And they're physical and they're kind of uh, present for you and they're visible for you, or at least a lot of people do. So we're looking at the permanent, the kind of perhaps you only have one arm. We're also going to look at the temporary stuff. Um, so, for example, with a lot of people, if they have a short-term injury, they will find workarounds, but they may not know about all the things that their devices can do for them because they won't access it. Because it's like, do you know what, in three weeks' time, this thing is gone, and I'll, I'll just do it later, and they just have kind of minor workarounds. And then, of course, you've got situational. If any of you are parents, you know that you only have access to both arms 50% of the time, right? And that's when your kid's asleep. Generally, when that happens, you'll often put the task away till later. We're going to have a look at the entire spectrum today. Um, there's over 13 million disabled, registered disabled people in the UK right now. And nearly 1 million of them have a learning disability in England here alone. Now, that really uh, impacts how they get to your content. So we're not just talking about kind of physical things that people first leap to when they think about accessibility and usability. 10% of children aged 15 or younger have a mental disorder. Now, for a lot of brands and organizations, they'll say, well, that's not me, right? 15-year-olds are not buying insurance. 15-year-olds are not buying cars. And that's lovely. But you know these people are going to grow up, right? And you know that we all talk to each other and we kind of get recommendations for each other. If you're in a university, of course, this is your target market because people start making decisions far before the actual crux of their kind of decision-making point where they absolutely have to make it. Various things have happened before and we're going to go through that today. Now, I know that you're all lovely, fluffy people, right? But let's just say you work in a mercenary environment as a point, 249 billion a year in this country is available for people with one disabled person. Now, if you don't need that kind of cash, that's fine. You can just hand that over to me. We're all good. That's a lot of money for organizations to be ignoring because they feel that accessibility is a tick box exercise. So long as the code's all right for screen readers and the color contrast is OK, we're all good, right? No. 249 billion pounds worth of no. So we're going to start there. Uh, generally, when I go into organizations and I talk about the accessibility of content, they'll say, oh, yeah, no, it's fine, because the screen readers work. So, mm, no. I'll give you one example uh, of an audience where that's not going to help. For example, profoundly deaf people. 
Um, when I say profoundly deaf, I mean those who have been deaf since birth. 8% of the profoundly deaf community in this country communicate by British Sign Language alone. If they have any English at all, it is as a second language. British Sign Language, like all sign languages, have a completely different grammatical structure, different vocabulary structure, everything, right? Um, you can't get to them. So if you tell me that your content and your website's accessible because screen readers work, you're just getting rid of anybody who A, can't hear, and B, don't read so well. I don't know if you've heard of the, the Chrome extension and No Coffee Simulator. Have you seen this? No? Some nodding? We're going to go to a rather lovely and fabulous website. No, oh, it's mine. <laughs> it's huge. Um, I'm going to see if this clicker works. So you can see this up here, that little black square with the circle. That's where it sits. It's a no coffee, cream, no coffee simulator. When you press that, you end up with this um, drop down. The top's got sliders. The bottom's just got radio buttons, right? All of these are impairments. Now, the top ones, you can increase their severity. That's what happens when you pull these sliders across. But the radio buttons, you can't. Now, this isn't 100% scientific. Right? This is not exactly 100%. But it is an indicator. And if you're starting to talk to your organization about accessibility, it's a really good tool to just start opening up that conversation. So if we were to add uh, cataracts, there are 330,000 people with cataracts in the UK right now. You could look at that, and you can still read it, right? One, the text is massive. And two, this is for quite a niche audience, right? This is not for your average people. So let's look at some impairments, and we're going to look at uh, some important information. So Brexit, right? Somebody had to bring it up. This was put out by the government a little while ago. It's preparing your business for the EU exit, because they can't call it Brexit, apparently. Um, and it's the, the opening part that takes up the whole screen is an image. I want you to remember that I haven't changed the resolution, the screen size, anything on any of the screen grabs that I'm going to show you today. It's exactly the same settings all the way through. When you do get to the information, it's pointless, completely Pointless. Now, this was taken a little while ago. They hadn't changed it a few weeks ago. They had changed it this morning. But it says now the, uh, the UK will leave the EU, and then it stops there. And then it says leaving the EU means your businesses will need to prepare for change. Brilliant, right? Delivering a deal negotiated with the EU remains the government's top right. Do you know what? I'm bored by that point. <laughs> Several reasons. One, I had to do something to get to that website. I would have had to have put something in, or I followed a link. There has been some text or some communication somewhere to get me to there. So telling me that, the EU, that Britain is going to leave the EU is not important. I should know this by now, right? Now, we do run a business. We run training and everything around the world. So this is really important to me. But that says nothing. I mean, with 2020 vision, that's pointless. It's just telling me stuff that, quite frankly, the BBC would tell me better. Let's add some pain to that. Uh, 480,000 people living with glaucoma at the moment. Just This is on the radio buttons at the bottom, so you can't increase the severity, but it kind of looks like that. So you have a narrow field of vision, then it kind of goes gray and a bit blurry, and then it goes black on the outside. If I was looking at that, I'm a little bit annoyed, right? Because it's still not telling me how I can actually prepare my business for the EU exit. If I've got glaucoma, not only am I a bit annoyed, but I can't see it properly either. So you're wasting my time. And my time involves pain. My time involves uncomfortable reading. Kind of not OK. Terms and conditions, another example then, because we all read the terms and conditions, don't we? Yeah? No. These ones are actually written in plain English. Please don't try to read them, because it's awful. They are in plain English. They've been done very well. The sentence structure, it's a bit long, but it, it, it's a good try. Um, this is with low acuity. So it's all blurry, and low acuity kind of goes across several different um, impairments. You still can't see it. 
And this is terms and conditions. We all know that we should probably read them, right? You know that software company that said that you were selling your soul to the devil? If you kind of, if you believe that sort of thing, if you were kind of clicking, we really should read them, and we don't, mostly, because even in plain English, it's boring. WK example, I haven't changed the screen settings. Now can you read any of that? It's a completely different experience. This is well written. It is well written. This is content design with accessibility in mind. This is where we start to open up that space. Use our headings, use our vocabulary and language, and don't get in the way of people. There's an old advertising adage that says, you've got five seconds to get my attention. Um, you've got five seconds to get my attention and 11 to keep it. Now, I rather think you've got three and five. Valuing time is the most precious thing that we have to give. And organizations sometimes don't do that quite right. With that in mind, another function of accessibility and usability is to get the information to the people at the time that they need it on the channel that they're on. So what happens is, when you think of something, depending on which academic study that you read, it's seven to nine or seven to 12 unconscious points before you can make a conscious decision, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning going, I know, I've thought of something brand new that I've never thought of before. It just doesn't happen. All your subconscious is working for you all the time. Then you decide that you're gonna go looking for something. Then your words pop up, Language Processing Center, for anybody who doesn't have a lesion or some sort of problem when they were a child, will be on the back left of the brain. The neurons start jumping up and down going, my word, my word is coming. It's like a little party in your head all the time. You think of those words and then they either come out of your fingers or out of your mouth. When you search, then you've got to go through that swathe of search results. There's quite a lot of noise at the moment about how much we trust things. You're starting to make decisions at that stage, because you've got loads of preconceptions and loads of belief that were attached to those seven to nine, seven to 12 unconscious points before you even get to this. Before you get to a single web page, you are making a lot of assumptions and uh, bringing a lot of baggage with you. There's quite a lot of noise at the moment about these snippets. So we know in government that most people just want one number. Right? So if you're on child tax credits and it changes each year, all you need is the number and then you disappear. Now, there is a lot of noise at the moment about, oh, traffic, if Google does this, then we won't have any traffic. My answer to that is that traffic alone is a vanity metric. If you just have traffic, you can have like 50 billion people, clickbait, for example, 50 billion people, and they don't remember you and they don't know who you are, and they'll never go back to you. They don't become your brand champions. You're just the thing that probably slightly annoys them, and then they leave. Now, do you want that? Or do you want 13 people who are really engaged with you and become your brand champions and recognize and recommend people to go to you and to engage with you and do it that way? What do you want? If you want just 50 billion likes, awesome. But your content strategy should understand that and it should know that all you're doing is chasing an empty number. When it comes to accessibility and usability, those snippets are great. Imagine you have uh, arthritis. Imagine that you have any kind of pain in your hands. Clicking and scrolling is massively painful. If we know from research that people just want one number or they want a number and then they go and do something else later on, just give them the thing and then move out of the way. It's actually just less painful. How many of you have heard of the ice bucket challenge? Hands up. How many of you have done it? Yeah, okay. All right, can you put your hands up? Please don't shout out, but can you put your hands up if you know what charity it was that did the ice bucket challenge? Okay, just look around you. Right, so how many hands were up were a minute ago and how many are up now? Thank you, if you just put your hands down. Can you tell me the presenting symptoms that that charity, uh, I can't do this without um, kind of giving it away, the presenting symptoms for the thing that the charity was trying to highlight? Now look around you. Okay, one, 
that I can see. I'm really sorry, the light's in my... Yeah, 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 a couple. All right. So, Ice Bucket Challenge, 194 million that grossed um, in, the, in the first few months it was running. Uh, it was for uh, ALS and its motor neuron disease. Now, if that campaign was to make money, brilliant! I mean, it totally... $194 million is not to be sniffed at, right? If that campaign, and I don't know because I don't work for them, if that campaign was to highlight ALS or to highlight the presenting symptoms, then it's not quite so successful. One in ten people in the UK did the ice bucket challenge and didn't send anybody any money. I, I don't know why they like pouring water on their head, but okay. What we would say is that if you're going to have some search results strategy, don't do it for SEO, don't do it for likes, don't do it for this kind of vanity thing. You can't play the SEO game. We can't keep playing it, right? You know at the beginning where we were, not we, obviously, some people were putting white text on white backgrounds and all the rest of it. Doesn't work, does it? It gets you blacklisted. Google has over 200 variables to its ranking algorithm. Google engineers probably, I don't know, I don't work for Google, uh, probably have to sign a contract like that thick, don't they? So that they don't tell everybody all the secrets. They will tell us what we need to know. We do the thing. Use all the SEO tools, but do it for the content. Do it for the people. You can't game a system if you don't know what the system is. So we would say have your search results strategy to minimize pain. And pain could be anything. Pain could also be, I don't have enough money for data. I don't have enough time for this. It doesn't need to be a physical pain. And we would generally say, have a strategy to help people. In fact, have a strategy. Loads of organizations don't even have a search result strategy for their content. So I just have one. Um, so the, the second rule for this is kind of, if you help people, people will come back to you and they will remember you. It's just how we work, right? Moving on then, it's kind of content will only work where your audience is. So an example of this then is, this is a press release. Um, it's from Gov UK. It's a while ago. It's about the A14 bridge. If you don't drive down the A14 and you're not near the A14, then you probably are not remotely interested in the A14, to be brutally honest. Not sure if you know, but you can spin Gov UK pages, which is why I use them a lot in presentations, because it gives you their metrics. And some organizations are not happy about showing their metrics. But anyway. Just draw your attention to the fact that it says it in the past six weeks. So these change regularly, OK? If you're going to go and start having a look around, just bear in mind it's six weeks. Um, zero, right? This was up at the time. I took the screen grab at the time. And there are no people going here. Funny, that. Other places might have been more useful, like social media, like your local paper. Now, a lot of people say, but local papers, they get it from press releases. No, they don't. <laughs> I can tell you that they don't. What they get it from is phone calls, generally, and good relationships with journalists, at least in this instance. So having your information on the right channel is both an accessibility and a usability need. Another example is uh, a speech. If you want to check out what your politicians were saying maybe a year ago to see if, I don't know, they're lying their asses off now, just saying. You can see all the speeches on GovUK as well. This is one about um, passenger assist. So if you do have a physical disability or an impairment, you can go, for example, to a train station and they'll make sure that there is a ramp ready for you at the right time, those sorts of things. Again, zero. This was taken at the time that it went up. But it's kind of a shame because this says that 71% of eligible people, so 71% of people, with disabled people or people with impairments have no idea that that scheme exists. And he goes on to say that getting people to the right place at the right time and communicating information down the line, this is the bread and butter of any rail company. Now, I would say making sure the rail companies do it would be the bread and butter of any government, but I could be wrong there. I tried to find you a good example of where this is on the internet at the time that this was going up. And I couldn't find one, because it's in the wrong place. This is quite the speech. This is actually very important. And it went nowhere. There was just nothing. So finding it at the right time 
is great and it's a start, but then we move on to structure, formats, and language. Everything starts here, yes, unless you're sent a link or you are doing voice interaction now with devices. So we start here and we understand the edges of what we're going to get. This should be telling you clearly about whether you're going to be going to the right place or not. Then you want the edges, and this is important for both accessibility and for usability. So we used to have a, a problem in government in like 20, mm, I don't know, 2008. Uh, where government was just kind of publishing everything. They were shoving everything out for transparency. Don't even know what that is, but still. They were just shoving everything out. What happened was people trusted the BBC before they trusted government because the BBC will give them the edges. If you have to keep looking over and over and over and over again for information, you get to a point where you're like, have I got it all? No? Oh, I'll just keep going. And you end up not trusting anything in the background. By having your design give the edges of content, then people start to trust it more and they'll start to slow down a bit more. Your first kind of 11, 15 words on the page, really important, particularly if you're thinking about those access needs. Am I on the right place? Am I going to get what I need? Is basically what you need to sort out in the first three to five seconds. Humans are extremely lazy, right? It actually takes fewer eye muscles to look down than it does across. You know the F-shape pattern, right? You've all seen it. And we all do this. So this bit is orientation. Am I going to get what I want? And then your brain goes, yeah, lazy. Can we just go down the page and see? And you'll start looking down the left-hand side. It's just how we work. So headings become really, really important, right? For accessibility, because screen readers can zip down them and they can give the whole story about what is on that page. And for people who can see, then again, they can skip down and, and see everything that's on the page. For usability, also helps with uh, some search engine ranking, apparently. Um, but generally, it's just for you to be able to get the gist of the page, right? All your headings should tell a story. So when we do courses, we take all the content out. We get people to sketch out content, and they'll put the headings with no other content. If we can't work out what that page is going to do and what I'm going to get from that, then they have to go back and do it again. Because sometimes people are making decisions on content from the headings alone. Headings are hugely important. I suggest you use them. Another uh, example will be video, then. Captions and transcript so that anyone who can read, right? So if people can't hear, and they can't hear it, and they can't read it, you're hiding all your best content in an inaccessible format. So if you are going to use videos, make sure you're, the, you're using them for the right reason. Right? So for accessibility, you still need to do it for anybody who does have a hearing impairment, who can read, so that they can still access your content. From a usability perspective, same thing. Not having head, headphones on a bus you still want to access that content, it's an access need, right? Having captions is really great. Having transcripts, obviously, you will need that um, for search engine also because they can't crawl videos at the moment. Um, but also, everybody in this country, not everybody, most people in this country with an average school education who can read, you can read faster than most people can speak. So unless you're talking to M&M or something, people might decide that they want to speed up. And if they do that, they will go for your transcript. It's both usability and accessibility. My favorite, favorite argument in all the world is jargon. From an accessibility point of view, you can alienate people and push them away from content purely by using terms that are difficult to understand doesn't mean to say you can't use them, just means explain them the first time you use it on a page. It's not difficult. From a usability perspective, it's exactly the same, right? You can see where this is going. For every accessibility thing, there is a usability thing. It's the same thing. So I'm going to give you an example of this. If I was to say to you, cheesy bobs can be a menace, but they're essentially harmless, how many of you know what a cheesy bob is? 
Anyone? Yeah. yeah. Do you come from Surrey? No, but I don't know. Ah, there you go. <laughs> okay, if you don't like bugs or insects or anything, just look down now. I'll tell you when you can look up. This is a cheesy bob. It's a woodlouse, basically. It's a woodlouse. Uh, you can look up if you were looking down now. Um, I come from Guildford, which is a small town in Surrey. And we call them cheesy bobs. There is a town that is like 20 miles away, and they have never heard of this. I was 34 before I didn't know that was called a cheesy bob. The guy who was in front of me is laughing his ass off. We're not together anymore. Um, <laughs> don't laugh at me. <laughs> That's jargon. That's technical. The thing is, I never questioned it. One, I don't talk about cheesy bobs very often, to be brutally honest. They don't come into conversation very often. And it was just a thing. I didn't question it. Why would I question that? I've been calling them cheesy bobs since I was four. And that's the thing with our technical and our specialist language. We understand it, and we don't question it. Good content people will question it. So jargon, idioms, any of those sorts of things. Um, don't use them because anybody who's not used to them won't be able to understand it. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, my audience is entirely specialists. They all understand my audience. They, they all understand my content. What I would say to you is, like, I'm really sorry that you're in an industry that's dying. Are you telling me you've got nobody new for you? Are you telling me that you can't share your knowledge with just interesting people, people who are interested in what you're doing? I've got kids. My boy's been into marine biology since he was about that high. He's looking up all sorts of stuff. We have the world in our pockets, right? People are interested. Do you really want to alienate them because of your specialist language? Generally, that's an architecture problem. It's not a page problem. You can do summaries. You can pull people in. And then you can give specialist knowledge as well, usability and accessibility. For anybody reading in a second language, and that includes BSL users, you can trip up any time that you use jargon, and they are particularly difficult for people who are further along the autism spectrum. So you're just alienating people purely by using technical language. Now, you might say to me, Sarah, this is lovely, but my organization loves a bit of jargon, right? Because this happens all the time. We're here for you. It's a shameless plug. We have a readability guidelines. It's an open wiki, which we would like you to all invite all of you to come and get involved with. It is a global project to start pulling together evidence and data for all style decisions that we're making again and again and again that actually are steeped in usability and accessibility. There's really no need for us to be having some of these conversations anymore. Everything is evidenced. So if you want to come and join in, please do. We have over 600 people around the world uh, lurking, generally. Most of them lurk. Uh, only about 13 people speak. But still, come and get involved. Um, and then you can have lots of data and evidence. So some of our readability guidelines then say helping, uh, clear language will help everybody. For example, people in a hurry. There's this whole thing, and it drives me bananas, about clear language being dumbing down, have you heard this? And being for thick people, which I find massively offensive. Um, that's not the case. Most of it is time. We have a problem with time now. We don't have time for you to get things wrong for us. We need to get what we need, even if it's watching funny cat videos, right? You want a video where the cat's funny. You don't want a cat is just sitting there. It's not funny. So I'm not just talking about big, massive things. I'm talking about tiny little things as well. With cognitive impairments, then, Jacob Nielsen said that um, you increase cognitive load by 11% every extra 100 words that you put on a page. Now, 11% isn't much if like, the worst thing that you need to worry about is doing the coffee run. And are you going to get everybody's weird coffee order right? 11% isn't much. but if you're looking after elderly parents, and you're looking after your kids, and you have a job, and you're trying to hold your family together, you may not have very much. And maybe all you've got is 11%. So keep adding this stuff to people with impairments, 
disabled people, plus people who are just really stressed and have no time, uh, alienates people. For motor impairments then, if you have funky and funny navigation, that's great, as long as your brand can handle it. And as long as you don't care whether people who are going to get lost are going to feel pain while they're doing it. Now, there's loads of really good accessibility kits that you can buy, but if your organization kind of won't stump up the cash for that, to give an example of this, you can buy two pairs of gloves, right, one medium, one large, sew them together up here, not all the way through, just on one side and then up here, and fill it with beans that you have in bean bags or rice or lentils or something, whatever, just to make it a bit hard to move the glove and then say, go on, now I'm going to give you a phone and you need to pick out that little button. And now you need to pick out, because we've used really funny and amusing and whatever text, and you don't know where you're going, you're going to have to go backwards and forwards several times. Do it with those gloves on. And when they go, oh, yeah, no, that's hard. I'm just going to take it off. Go, mm -mm -mm. pop those back on for another hour. And then let's have a chat about that. So it's just a, a way of getting around it. From the visual impairment section, short sentences really useful. If you can only see that much and everything else is blurry, you take in information with your peripheral vision, basically. Jason Santamaria did a really good article about this. I suggest you go look it up. I don't have time to go into it today. But you have this kind of saccade thing where you jump along your text. If you have it as short sentences, you can take in more information in one go. It's just more useful. I would say is generally people want to add whatever it is that you're saying, even if it's funny cat videos or it's like probate, whatever it is, they want to add it to their own context. Right? Nobody just wants to marvel at your language, unless you're an author or a designer or whatever, and that's kind of what you're showing. Nobody wants to do that. They want to look at something and feel something or do something about your content. So they just want to add it to their own, to their own context. But you don't have to be boring. There's loads of this kind of conversation about, oh, if you, if you do everything in clear, structured language, and if it's all plain English and stuff, then, then you just take the creativity out of everything. And I did complete rubbish. I was going to swear, but that's, I've got words on it. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, say three words to you, put three words on this screen, and I want you to just put up your hand if you know the brand that I'm talking about. Ready? Just do it. Oh, you do? Oh, that's interesting. That's such a surprise. So, just do it is in your common vocabulary set. So, the average learner in this, in this country has 5,000 terms in their primary set, 10,000 terms in their secondary set. That 15,000 terms makes up to, up to 80% of your language that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. That's in there. They hung a whole campaign off that. The creative that sits behind that line can change every five minutes and can be extremely creative. But it only hangs off three words. This is arguably, and people do argue about it a lot as far as I can see, this is arguably the most successful advertising campaign in the world in history. It's from 1959. It was by an agency called DDB. It was about selling Volkswagen Beetles to people in America because Americans have massive cars and they were like, this one's a bit small, what's this? They hung that whole campaign off of two words, think small. Now, some of those words down the bottom won't be in the 15,000 terms, but everything around them is. It's not about individual little terms. It's about how you're communicating. Extremely creative, extremely successful, whether it's the successful or, or not, doesn't matter. Extremely successful campaign. So if people come to me and say, being clear, being accessible, being usable is boring, I would just push them to most of the extremely successful campaigns in the world, and you will find accessible language. Fast forward to here then, 2015, there was Like a Girl campaign. It was uh, launched at the Super Bowl. It's about how um, females are perceived. So if you ask a, a little girl how a girl runs, she'll like go mm, like this. And if you say to a woman, how do you run, they'll like start running like Penelope Pitstop or something. It's just our perception. 
It went viral, millions of views all around the world. Note on hashtags, if you put up caps for individual words, it's easier to read. But you don't need to have all these kind of formatting, all these funny little tricks to stand out. As a content person, um, you can change your sentence length. It's a very simple trick. We know that people need sort of like 14 to 29 words is really pushing it, but you want a sentence that's kind of 14 maybe to 20 words long to really get people to make it inclusive. What you can do is have a 20-word sentence, a 5-word sentence, and a 20-word sentence afterwards. What happens is it absolutely breaks the rhythm that you're looking for. So if you, again, if you have kids or if you remember back to your childhood stories, um, when your parents read it to you, if they were reading it at the right speed and not just trying to get to the end so that you would go to sleep, if they were reading it properly to you, you'd have a rhythm. Your brain looks for that rhythm. It wants that rhythm. And if you break that, your brain freaks out and it does a regressive read and it will go back up. Now, this is great if you have one thing on a page that you really want to pull out that you don't want to use bold because we don't use bold it makes people's eyes dance around don't use italics all of those sorts of things if you don't want to do that you can break that rhythm however do it carefully i would definitely only do it once on a page probably and test it because what's happening is you are breaking that rhythm and people will stop dead for that you need to just be careful with it but it's a good technique to use also, use space. We know that designers bang on about white space all the time. So do content people. From a brain perspective, the more white they see, the more they think, oh, this isn't going to be complicated. So you've got loads of headings on a page telling a story. You have shorter sentences so that it's more inclusive for people with visual impairments, for people who just can't be bothered to hold the front of a sentence while you get to the point when you get to the end of it. And you use lots of space and lots of shapes with your bullet points to pull the eye down a page and just make it easier for them to understand. What we would say is that struggling is not success. <laughs> people are doing, oh, people spent a long time on the page. Mm hmm. You couldn't get through it. That's why. It's not a good metric. When we do this, we might talk to our organizations, and it's not easy to get them to move away from language that they've been using 20, 30, 40 years, right? I get that, but the conversation can be creaked open if you find it relevant for them. So, just in case you're in an organization that kind of finds some of these things difficult, I would say find a relevant pain, something's relevant to them. So if I know a client quite well, I might say to them, oh, you know, you know that ski accident you had? Remember how painful that was? Put that in your hands. Put that behind your eyes, whatever it is. If not, I will use migraines. I used to get a lot of migraines. I get vertigo. I can't see. I can't stand up. My vision goes all blurry, those sorts of things. Most people know somebody who's got migraines, and they know that it's not a posh word for a headache. So I will get them to feel a pain. I mean, actually understand one and say, right, imagine that wherever. Then I put their content on a very small screen. So I've got quite a big phone. I'll pick out a small one from somebody. And if they've got the kind of matte um, cover that you can have on it, rip that off if you're not scared of being fired, obviously. <laughs> if you're working with horrible people, don't do that. But you can put a glare on the screen. It's amazing what that does. Because people go, oh, and they'll move it. And they're like, mm -mm -mm. just keep that still. Because I still need you to get to your content without you doing that. Then add a distraction, right? Google did a study, 67% of the time we're on one device, we're on another one. So you know when you're watching the Bake Off and you're tweeting about it at the same time, right? So is everybody else. So again, when I'm in an office, I might be really annoyed. It depends on how much shame or dignity you have, to be brutally honest. I'll go up to people's ears and go, me, 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 or whatever, in their ears to just distract them a little bit, because that's how life works for a lot of people, not always for a lot of people. And then lastly, imagine that your hands hurt. Get them to put on the gloves. There's glasses as well, which are really good. Get them to do those sorts of things and then say, now use your content.
Now tell me why you need jargon on the page. It is always best to go to a usability lab with disabled people, test, do the videos, share it with your organization. It is. But a lot of organizations won't do this. They don't put value on it, and they won't put money into it. So if you have that environment, brilliant, go, fabulous. Can you please share all your results so that we can all use them? But if you can't, then you can start to use some of these techniques. What we would say is that accessibility is far more than just color contrast and screen readers. Right? Just shortening up your sentences can open your content to a really wide audience. And you won't lose people who are terribly intelligent and can just skip through it. They'll just skip through it faster. They'll be fine. You won't lose them by communicating well. What we would say is that it's not dumbing down. It's opening up. Thank you.